Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are going to have a good lesson tonight. This is going to be an interesting um, study tonight. We're not going to cover really that many verses of Moses, but Moses is by far one of the most, most, most interesting and most relevant uh, characters in the entire scriptures besides Jesus. Um, and we can talk about Paul, we can talk about a lot of other people, but when it comes to who is really the, the relevant people, um, oh my goodness, Moses, it is, it is just absolutely incredible who Moses is and what he has done for the nation of Israel. Just a couple of things just to fill you in. Moses has been quoted by every president of the United States except for one. It's there's a great book by uh, I think it's Bruce Feiler is his name, and he uh, he wrote a book about Moses being the god of three uh, three of the world's great religions: Islam, Christianity, and uh, Judaism. And the interesting thing is that the um, the way that he looked at Moses, he's going through and quoting all the presidents that use quotes of Moses and different things about Moses. It, it is absolutely incredible. He is the most quoted person in the Old Testament, or in the, other than Jesus. He's the most quoted person by the presidents of the United States. So it just kind of one of those fun little facts. So we want to pray. We've got a couple of prayer requests. Uh, Eileen's husband, Larry, is recovering. He had back surgery yesterday, and uh, he's doing okay, but uh, I can tell you a test after two of them that it takes a little while to get back up on your feet, literally, and to start feeling pretty good. So uh, we want to pray for him. And who was the other one today? Um, Becky's son. Oh, yeah, Becky's, oh, Becky's son. Becky Hampton's son and daughter-in-law. We want to be praying for them uh, and that the Lord just meets their need. We are gonna go to Moses or to, to Moses. We're gonna go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're gonna go to Moses. Let's get started. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, open up our minds, our hearts, our eyes tonight. Father, let us see things so that we can understand better how you work what your character is, who Jesus is, so that we can understand about us and how we fit into this big picture of yours. Father, reveal to us openly your word. We thank you and we praise you for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for Becky's son and daughter-in-law. Father, we pray, Lord God, that you bless them. Father, meet the need that they have abundantly above all that they're able to ask or to think about. Lord God, make things so incredible in their life, Lord God, that they have to see it's you and they have to see your hand of mercy and grace flowing upon them. We thank you for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for Larry. He is already healed by the blood of Jesus. Father, his back is healed. Every part of his body is healed and we praise you for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, let's get started tonight. This is going to be a, a wild I can tell you, it's going to be a wild class. All right. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, God here is clearly identifying himself as the I am. It, there's no guesswork. He, he's not, uh, he's going to clarify it uh, for Moses that he is the God of Moses' forefathers, the same one that Abraham worshipped, Isaac worshipped, and Israel worshipped. And he's going to clarify that because he doesn't want Moses making any mistakes here. In fact, he goes on in Exodus 3, 14 and 15 to say, And God said to Moses, because Moses asked him, who, 
I mean, this is after God's already said who he is, right? God says to Moses, I am who I am. He gives him the eternal name of the almighty creator, the I am. Means the, I am the one, literal translation, I am the one that exists who exists. In other words, the self-existent one. Nobody created him. Nobody, uh, nobody made God up. There, there wasn't two other gods out there that had a baby God. There, God just exists. He has always existed. It speaks of his, uh, his infinite span of, of existence. He is. He exists because he exists. Which means, and we're going to get into this as we get along here, which means everything about him is purposeful because everything that exists is about him existing. I hope you caught that. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. So if anybody has a squabble or has a contention about what the name of God is, you know, is it Yahweh? Is it El? Is it El Shaddai? Is it Adonai? What, what is God's name? Is it Jesus? Is it Holy Ghost? I mean, what, what is God's name? He says clearly and plainly to Moses that the Lord, Elohim, or pardon me, I am, is his name. I am who I am. I am is his name. You say, well, what's, what's God's name? I am. <laughs> I exist. I am the ever existent one. God isn't leaving this up to Moses to figure it out. He clearly is giving him the identity of who he's speaking with. He, he's not, it, the, the number of times that he repeats it in this segment, this conversation that he's having with Moses at the burning bush, he, he isn't leaving it for Moses to try and interpret who he is. We find that with Jesus. Jesus never left it for us to interpret who he is. I mean, I, I know there's people out in the world, there's preachers, there's uh, people of other religions, people of other faiths, people of, um, within Christianity that want to try and interpret who Jesus is. We don't need to interpret who Jesus is. Jesus told us who he is. The same as God tells us who he is. It is God's MO. It is within God's character not to leave us wondering about who anybody is within the Godhead. He's, he's very clear about it. This is who I am. Now, we, we have to understand that in order to understand what Moses is looking at here. Remember, Moses was born as a Hebrew before he could talk, before he could understand anything. Shortly after his birth, he was put into a, a wicker or a grass type of a, of a basket. He was floated down a river. He floated into the arms of Pharaoh's daughter. She pulled him in, took him as her own, knew he was a Hebrew child, called his own mother, or had her, had his, her maid servants call his own mother to come and, and feed him. And then he was raised for the rest of his life as an Egyptian in the hierarchy of Egypt, highly educated. He would have known all the Hebrew gods or all the Egyptian gods. He would have known what each one of those gods represented. He would have known what they were worshipped for. He would have been involved in all of that worship of the Hebrew gods, or pardon me, of the Egyptian gods. He isn't, he isn't by any means when he runs into God. I mean, he understands that the the uh, the Hebrews had their own God. He understood that who that God was, that he was he was this God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob worshipped. He never, up until this point in time, really has a relationship of his own with that God. He has a relationship with the Hebrew people. Now he runs head on into the almighty God who says, I am who I am. Man, you talk about scary experience. 
I mean, Scriptures tells us that it's, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How would you like to run into a bush? You're out in the woods, you know, walking your dog, and, and you run into a bush that's on fire, yet it's not burning. All of a sudden, out of the bush comes a voice that calls your name, and, and it must have been a, a, a voice that, was, uh, that grabbed a hold of Moses' heart and, and tells him, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Moses immediately takes off his shoes and falls to his face and, and then starts his conversation with God. Now, I want to take you to the, the part of the conversation that he has, because this is really the discussion I want to have tonight. It, it's, it's important for us to understand um, this, this part about Moses, because I've already told you, he's, he's raised up in Pharaoh's house. He's raised up as an Egyptian, educated as an Egyptian. He's in the hierarchy. He's one of Pharaoh's sons for the most part. Um, and, and now he's, you know, he's killed, a, 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 uh, he's killed an Egyptian. He's being hunted because of that by the Egyptians. Pharaoh wants him because he, you know, said he was a Hebrew or came forth as a Hebrew and killed this Egyptian. It, it would have caused, a, you know, maybe an uprising had the uh, Hebrews followed him and, and they all, and they were way more than at that point in time than, than the Egyptians. So if this thing could have really gone bad for Pharaoh, so Pharaoh is on the hunt. Moses runs through the desert. He finds uh, his soon to be father-in-law and, and here he is uh, with Ruel and, and his wife and raising sheep. From hierarchy in, in Egypt to raising sheep, which was an abomination, by the way, to, to the Egyptians. You, you have to kind of get that part to understand where we're going with this tonight. Exodus chapter 30, uh, 3, 20 through 21. God's telling him how he's going to do this thing. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, I will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. God tells Moses, this is the way I work things. Man, if we could get this understanding into the people of God, this is how God functions. He gives favor to his people. In the middle of their enemies, he gives favor to his people. However he chooses to do it, he's going to make sure that you get favor in your life. He's going to have you being blessed going in and coming out. He's going to make sure that you're blessed. To understand who you are in Christ is to have a revelation of this right here. When he calls us children of God, heirs, heirs according to the promise, all of those things in the New Testament, it, it is an amazing thing for us to grab hold of to really know that that's us. You know, we, we can believe maybe some, it's somebody else, you know, there's somebody in the church that got rich or somebody in the church that has a lot of things, drives up in the Mercedes. Well, yeah, God blesses them, but, but you know, maybe that's not for me. Listen, God has put it out here from the beginning to the end, that he intends with his heart to bless his people and to call them his favored in every way, in every way. Now, just so we know we're not alone, Exodus 4, 1 and 2. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. A rod. Now, how many of us, how many of you, you can give me comments on this. Don't be embarrassed. We're all family. How many of you, God has spoken to your heart and, and put things into you, things of greatness? Things that you know are going to happen or, or that you, you wish in your mind were going to happen. Um, and you've said back to God, 
Well, yeah, but suppose people won't won't believe me. Suppose they don't they don't really think it's you. Suppose uh, I I screw this up, you know, uh, and and then people laugh at me and they and, you know I, I don't want to risk that. I I, I don't want to risk going over to my neighbor and praying for them when they have, you know, just diagnosed with some disease and. Uh, and pray over them the prayer of faith. I, I, I don't want, I mean, what, what if they don't get well? I mean, you know, then they won't believe me or they won't believe you or they, you know, how can I, how badly can I mess this up? That's where Moses is at. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's a good word, really, Richard, that nobody can prevent God's will or God's desire from being done. Um, and they can't prevent his favor. But we do stop it from being manifest in our life from time to time because we just simply don't believe. And I want to show you some things here in, in just a minute on that. But we do put ourselves in the same shoes as Moses often. And we just doubt. And that... That's exactly right, Nancy. That that is why the word tells us that we uh, we have to have boldness. We we have to have boldness. Now, boldness the the Hebrew or the Greek word for boldness means all outspokenness. We need to be all outspoken about who we are in Christ. It listen sliding into Christianity and sliding into prayer and sliding into miracles just doesn't happen. I mean. Those things, the things that God intends are going to happen, and I want to show you how they happen. It isn't in God's character to use things that are not already here. Throughout the Bible, God uses the stuff he already created in order to bring about the furtherance of his word. We find limited use of the Hebrew word bara, meaning to create, implying a thing formed out of something non-existent. There's very limited use of that. The earth, man, animals were all created from within God. In other words, there wasn't anything pre-existing here that he put together a man with uh, other than dirt. But the man himself, it, he says God barah him. He created him. He, he, he formed him himself and in the same way with the living beings. Now, when it comes to uh, plants and animals, our plants and mountains and rivers and all those, in fact, the whole earth, they, he says the earth itself in the beginning was created bara out of nothing. It was just out of God. He created that. Now, when God asked Moses what is in his hand, he's given him a clue that he gave us what we need for life and godliness when we were created. He formed us in the womb with gifts, talents, and abilities. When God says to Moses, I mean, Moses comes to him. God tells him exactly what he's going to do, how he's going to do it, lays it out for him. You're going to go, this is going to happen. Tells him, I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord God. I'm the same God that created everything. I am the God that exists. Tells him all that stuff. I'm going to do, uh, bring this upon Pharaoh. I'm going to bring that upon Pharaoh. Moses, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, God. And, and yes, he was a stutterer. It, Look, look, you know, God, I, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm not capable. Uh, you know, I just can't do it. And God says, Moses, what's in your hand? Moses says, well, a rod. God uses what he gave you. What he put in your hand is what he gave you. What he put in your life is what he gave you. He knew how you were formed from before you were in your mother's womb. And then he crafted you on purpose, intentionally, out of his own heart with gifts and talents and abilities. Look at Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone who spreads abroad, uh, abroad the earth by myself. God says, listen, I formed you from the womb. Exactly right, Richard. What, what can a stick do? 
we say that about our own life. We say exactly the same thing Moses did. What can I do with that? What I, I mean, I, I just can sing a little. I mean, no big deal. What can I do with that? I remember hearing uh, Joseph's... Um, oh, shoot. I can't think of his name now. Prince. Joseph Prince. I was having a, yeah, that's it. I was having a brain freeze. I, I remember hearing Joseph Prince's uh, testimony. He was a stutterer and he had no talents or anything else, but God gave him the, the ability to believe. That's it. To believe that he had, he was going to do something. Now, he didn't believe it in and of himself. He believed it in and of God. And he's got one of the biggest ministries on the earth right now on the planet and preaches Jesus all over the place. Um, he's one of the biggest voices for grace right now. And he didn't have any particular talent. He wasn't born to a wealthy family. His daddy wasn't a preacher. In fact, his daddy wasn't even a believer. He, he didn't have the things that you would think somebody that now is uh, doing what he's doing he didn't have any of that to begin with. God uses what he gave you, not what he gave somebody else. He's not expecting you to use what he gave somebody else or what he gave you the same way that somebody else uses a similar talent. We have absolutely no qualifications by the world's standards when it comes to the abilities God gives us. We all have our own. They're all unique. And that's the point that God is making with Moses. And it is a point for us today. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That word knew is, it is imperative. It's, it's not he knew of you. He knew you. He knew exactly who you were. He knew exactly what your heart was going to be. He knew exactly the moves you were going to make, the things, decisions you were going to make through your life. He knew you. It's, an, it's, a, it's a word that is deeper than having a knowledge of somebody. It, it is having an intimate uh, knowledge that is inward of somebody to where you know their thoughts, their abilities, their talents, uh, the decisions they're going to make before they make them. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. This is the call of Jeremiah, and he, and he lays it out, what he's going to be. He said, listen, before you were ever born, I, this is what I designed you to be. Did Jeremiah believe in himself? No. If you read Jeremiah's story, Jeremiah never believed in himself. Jeremiah believed in God. For many, the idea of a predestined path, it's, it's hard to imagine or believe. The idea is mostly propagated is every step of a person's life being planned out with the person having no choice. I mean, that's the way it's kind of taught. Uh, there are some faiths, some parts of Christianity that teach that predestination means uh, you don't have any choice. Whatever you are today, you had no choice in it. You, you couldn't have decided. You couldn't have made a choice one way or the other all along the, the road. You're just predestined to be this. So if you're, you know, I guess if you're a sailor, you were predestined to be a sailor. If you're a car salesman, you were predestined to be a car salesman. If you're a multimillionaire running six businesses, that's what you were designed to be. There are some people that they, that's what they teach. The truth of the word is that we were predestined with a path for our life laid out in minute detail, but one in which we make all the choices with the knowledge of God. So it, it, nah, let me get this so you can kind of grab hold of what I'm saying. God knows what we shall or shall not choose. God knows it. He's laid out a plan in our life, but because he knows the beginning from the end, God knows what choices we'll make as we go through life. And he, because of how he designed us, we still have choices on everything in our life. You can choose to go to church on Sunday morning or not. You can choose to pray or not. You can choose to believe or not. You can choose if you want to worship the moon or a tree or your next door neighbor. 
You can choose any of that stuff that you want, and God knows you're choosing it before you choose it. And the whole time you're choosing the wrong things, God is putting in your way choices for the right things. I I know it sounds like, wow, then how can anybody ever not just obey God? How can they how can people be lost? How how can it it not work out um, for everybody? Well, the truth is, it, it is God's will for all men to come to repentance. Yet we know not all men will. It it is up to every single person can choose, and God has already laid out a path whereby if they make that choice, then they're they're gonna have a relationship with him and future choices that they make after that point in time, really it's impossible to make mistakes. You make mistakes here, but you don't make mistakes there. I hope you can understand that. <laughs> Let me give you some more. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Not some things beautiful, everything beautiful. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. The, the wisest person that's ever lived, besides Jesus, Solomon, given wisdom, he says, listen, nobody can find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. We don't know. We can think our life is going one direction. God's got a whole other plan for us. We'll get to that plan, and we will ultimately end up where we need to be. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God will accomplish all of his pleasure, no matter what. Our biggest contention in this life, and this is why we need to pay attention to Moses. We, from, from here on out, you guys got to make me a promise. From here on out, when you read the book of Exodus and you read about Moses, and, and we get into Numbers and Deuteronomy and uh, Leviticus, and you read about Moses, understand this is your life. We, we have the same kind of a destiny. God chose us on purpose to accomplish great things. Now, great things for you and great things for me will be two different things. For some people, great things will be, you know, graduating college. For another person, it'll be finding a cure for whatever's ailing uh, the world. For others, it might be going to the moon. For others, it might be um, reading, you know, 10,000 books. Who knows what greatness is for each one of us? We don't know. But what we do know is that all of those things will work out for God's glory. If you're in a path of something that is not working out for God's glory, you're not in the right path. Start looking for how that path turns into the other path. Because God will lead you, God will lead you, and he will take you in the right direction. Now, we want to get into a few more things here. Romans 9, 13 through 24. Romans 9, 13 through 24. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Here's an interesting thing about this Pharaoh that Moses is told he's going to go up against. Pharaoh was also chose with a purpose. Moses was chose with a purpose. Pharaoh was chose with a purpose. Pharaoh's purpose was to glorify God. 
You see that there? Pharaoh's purpose was to glorify God. That is, that is so right. God's choices are always there. Pharaoh had choices all along the road. But to glorify God, his heart was continually hardened. Now, God wasn't making his heart hardened. He was created that way, on purpose, intentionally, so that God would gain glory through this whole deal of Israel being let go. It had to be like this. For one thing, so that all the prophetic words would be spoken and done exactly as God had placed them. And so that Israel would be in the place where they were. Look what he says there. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For, he ha for who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me that like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? This is the same question Pharaoh and Moses are, are put into. Can either one of those say, God, why did you make me like this? Moses tries to. God, I'm a stutterer. I can't do this. I mean, I, what do I have? Well, what's in your hand? Well, I mean, what, it's irrelevant what I have in my hand. I can't do it. I mean, I'm going to look like an idiot out there if you, you go sending me there and I, you know, I go to say you're God and I, and I stutter all over myself. And I, I can't even say who you are, who it was that I ran into. Pharaoh, on the other hand, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, doesn't want to let these people go, even after he's, he's told he needed to. All for God's glory. After this finally comes and the people of Israel get let go, though, Pharaoh still has another choice. He can believe in the God of the Hebrews if he wants to. God isn't abandoning him, not giving him a choice, not giving him any. I mean, God doesn't choose people to go to hell. He never does. But he creates them in a certain way for them to accomplish his glory in the earth. And yes, yeah, some of them are going to do some things that aren't all that, that crazy <laughs> to be done. And they're going to. The end result of their life, though, is they're going to give God glory, as Pharaoh did. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with such long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles? Here we have the one of the most intriguing verses dealing with the subject of predestination and or the foreknowledge of God. God isn't only working things out for the Jews, his chosen people. God is working things out as well for the Gentiles. Both camps fit into the final big picture of his glory. And and so we, we kind of have to see that, and we have to understand where we fit into that picture. If we don't understand that, we'll, we'll miss the opportunity in our life. Acts 2, 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Here we see a, a great uh, picture of what I'm talking about. Here, Peter's talking to the children of Israel. He's, he's up giving a message. This is right after Pentecost. 
And he explains to them, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to do miracles. And he explains who Jesus was. Of course, they know that. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. God knew Jesus was going to go to the cross. It was God's foreknowledge for him to go to the cross. It was God's determined purpose for Jesus to go to the cross. I, and I know, listen, I've had the question asked a thousand times. Well, why does God let bad things happen? Why, why did God allow Jesus to go to the cross? Why? And the, really, the truth is, he was sent there by God. God knew exactly. God, God purposed in his heart for Jesus to go there so that he could pour out all of his wrath upon Jesus. Now, why does God allow those things to happen? Why does God allow bad things to happen? Does, does he have to allow bad things to happen? Is it in his will for bad things to happen? Well, yes and no. God doesn't purpose in his heart anything bad. He says, I'm a good God. I'm a good God. Out of him is goodness. He doesn't say anywhere that I'm, uh, hey, I'm, I'm good to those who worship me, but I'm, I'm bad to those who don't. He, but he instead says that he is a God of mercy. In fact, he says he is mercy. His, his whole name is, he, is mercy. Yeah, that's exactly the, the question I get asked. Why did God, if the Jews were his chosen people, why did God allow six million Jews to die at the hands of the Nazis? Why did he allow that to happen? Good, all good questions. All very good questions. And when you read the scriptures, you say, well, there was still a purpose in that. Yeah, why did it allow Corona? Now. Here we go. In the foreknowledge of God, God knew all of these things were going to happen. But God, in his foreknowledge, also knew, also knew those who were going to believe. He designed us and purposed in his heart for us to show forth his glory. Romans 8, 29-30 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. God called people on purpose to be conformed to the image of his son. The predestination for all those that choose to follow Christ is for them to be conformed to the image and likeness of God. Now this bears the question, what about those who don't follow Christ? What about those who choose not to? If it's God's will for all men to come to a knowledge of truth, why do some men not come to a knowledge of the truth? Is it because God doesn't want them to? Because God would want to destroy his creation? Or is there some other purpose? Is there some other way? Well, God gives us free choice. Yeah, they harden their hearts, exactly. They harden their hearts. Be because God gives us free choice. He gives us free will. If we don't have free will, he's not a good God. If we don't have free will, if we don't have the right to choose which direction we want, which thing we want to do in life, how we want to go. If if we want to, if if we can, uh, if we can avoid choosing, if if we had no choice, how would we ever know we love God, and how would we ever know He loved us? Yeah, it, it's not really his way of, he, God's really not thinning out the herd there, the population. Um, God takes and gives us free will to choose him, knowing that some of us won't. 
knowing that some people won't. They'll refuse him. They'll refuse him all the way to the end. There is a, a verse in the book of Revelation where it says at the great white throne judgment that the people who were there, all small and great, it says all the dead, small and great, that they stand before God. Now, it's talking about those who have chosen to accept Christ as Lord and Savior and those who have not. They're all there. God reveals himself in all of his glory, reveals exactly who his son is. He reveals how easy it is to have salvation. He reveals everything, all the glory, all the goodness, all that there is about God. He reveals it to them, to all the people. And yet, at the great white throne judgment, there is a mass amount of people who still choose to believe. In fact, it says that they gnash their teeth. Jesus said over and over that in the kingdom of God, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In the end, in the judgment, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, I always understood that to be, when I was coming up as a, as a believer, a young believer, I understood that it is, you know, like they're getting smacked on top of the head. God's bonking them or something, you know, or because they're seeing this punishment and they're they're in such pain, they're gnashing their teeth. A f few years back, I was reading through some uh, articles about Hebraisms, the, the Hebrew traditions and, and the things that the way Hebrews practiced. One of the things that I ran across is that verse, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Well, I found out that wailing and gnashing of teeth is not because you're being bonked on the head, you know, with a big stick and it hurts. So you're uh, gritting your teeth. Wailing and gnashing of teeth is a sign of anger. It's an intense anger, a hatred. So you're, uh, you know, you're gritting your teeth and you're wailing ab about it. In the end time, even knowing that God is there and God is is uh, brought salvation to all who would believe, even exposing himself in the entirety of his grace and mercy to all of the souls who had ever lived, there are going to be many, many thousands and millions of people who are going to gnash their teeth and say, we hate you. We hate you. And God's going to take them and he's going to broom them away into the lake of fire. It's sad. But even in the end time, at the great white throne judgment, God is going to reveal himself as all merciful, which kind of gives you the idea he's given them another chance to believe. He's given them one more chance and another chance and another chance and another chance. All the way to the end, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's how merciful he is. And so we see here that it is not God who punishes, it is not God who kills, it is not God who sends plagues and pestilences. In fact, the opposite is true. God is holding them things back because the, our enemy, the devil, is always trying to bring that upon mankind. He is always trying to kill man. He is always trying to wipe out any semblance of, of our worship. It's evil. It's just pure evil. And that's who the devil is. And he is always trying to deliver to man some sickness or some disease, something that will tear down God's glory and will deliver man to death in a sinful state. Romans 11, 1 through 6. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, who pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I am alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response to him say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. When, listen, what, when the prophet is saying to God, e Elijah is saying to him, Lord, wait a minute. 
these guys have killed all the prophets. You need to kill them. <laughs> Help me with this, God. They, these people are terrible. I'm just left alone. I'm the only one left. God says, wait, whoa, 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 time out. I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee. They won't bow to Baal. They won't choose somebody else. They still love me. They want to worship me. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There it is. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer is no longer grace. But if it is works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Everything the Lord does is by and through grace. God favors whom he will favor. We know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. We, we, well, well, how do we gain God's favor? It's easy. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus came to give us life, and to give us life a little bit, right? No. Give us life more abundant, right? That's why we need to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. The thing that Moses had, and, and we might have an argument and say, well, it doesn't sound like Moses had a lot of faith. He's trying to talk God out of this. Moses is trying to talk him out, and the whole time he's going along with him. It's, it's the picture. It's, it's how God operates. Hey, I want to show you that you can. You think you can't? I'm going to give you faith so that you can. Take a look here. Yeah, the devil is a counterfeiter, Nancy. That's a good word. And, and he, he will counterfeit all kinds of things to try and get us to follow and, and look for what we might believe is God. We have to look at what is God. It will fit into the purpose for our life. Look at Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, here's the key. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Having a purpose in life is not the end all to your salvation. Man, there's been all kinds of books written about finding your purpose and the purpose of this and that. But take a look at what it says here about all that. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. God has blessed us in all way and chosen us before the earth was even formed. He chose us. That we should be holy and without blame. He predestined us to adoption. But it was all according to the good pleasure of his will the whole purpose being that we would be to the praise of his glory. It's not so he's just, you know, in glory. It's so that we would be to the praise. So that when people looked at our life, when and, and when the angels looked at our life, and when all of, uh, all of um, creation looked at the life of the believer, they say, wow, look at, that's to God's glory. That person is to God's glory. Many have taught, uh, taught on and written about the need for purpose. So we, consequently, we have a purpose-driven church, a purpose-driven ministry, a purpose-driven life, purpose-driven pastors. Moses had a pur purpose, but Pharaoh also had a purpose. It is not purpose or even the willful following of purpose that gives us favor with God. Purpose doesn't give you favor. If you discover your purpose in life, that doesn't give you favor. Knowing and following one's purpose can be counterproductive, in fact, to the will of God. If purpose replaces faith. 
So many people have said, well, geez, the purpose of my life is this or that. And they've gone headlong, everything, pushed everything aside so they could accomplish their purpose in and of themselves without faith in Christ, just on their own talents and abilities. Yet faith can be an idol if it replaces Christ. Moses was not called to a purpose, and he was not driven by faith. In fact, all he does is question the call, the purpose, and ultimately God. Yet in the end, God pulls him into fulfilling his purpose for him. God pulls Moses into fulfilling God's purpose for God. Consequently, Moses becomes the most well-known character of the Old Testament, kicking and screaming. When we find a purpose, like if we see Moses here, and all of a sudden God's, you know, Moses says, oh yeah, oh, man, I found my purpose. Now I know how to do what I'm going to do. Because after all, it's my purpose, and I know my purpose, and because I have my purpose, I can go accomplish my purpose. How many of us have done that? How many of us have walked out in our own powers and abilities, our own, our own wills, to try and accomplish what we thought our purpose was in life? I think a lot of us have. I think a lot of us have, have moved right into doing things. And I know, I know there's stuff, I'll raise my hand, I know there's stuff that I went because of what I thought my purpose was for a certain thing. I went and did it my way, my ability, put my head down, just bull through it, only to fail. And, and then question God. God, what, what, what are you doing here? I thought this was my purpose. I, I, I mean, I found my purpose. I, what am I, what, why am I failing if I'm in my purpose? How about dummy? Because you were doing it without faith. Because you weren't relying upon Christ. You were relying upon you. Yeah, had good testimony, Nancy. Look at Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him. Wow. You know nobody has a purpose for you? Moses' purpose wasn't for him. Moses' purpose wasn't even for the children of Israel. Moses' pur purpose was for God. It was for God. God had made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would make them a great nation. The children of Israel were going to be a great nation because God accomplishes his purpose. It could not happen if Moses operates according to the purpose of Moses. Moses has to operate according to the purpose of God. Now, here's the secret to that who works all things according to the counsel of his will. If it's according to the counsel of God's will, if your life is according to the counsel of God's will, how can your purpose be messed up? How can it become your purpose when it is according to the counsel of God's will? It will automatically fall in, and your purpose will be according to the purpose of Christ, not you. And here's the second part of that, that listen what he says here about us when we fall into that, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. We will never be to the praise of our glory. We will always be to the praise of his glory. Moses was to the praise of God's glory. Oh, there were times that Moses wasn't to the praise of God's glory, like when he struck the rock twice. We'll get into that as we get further along. When he struck the rock twice. That wasn't to the praise of God's glory, but it was to the praise of God's glory when he's in this place right now where he's going, Lord, I just don't know. I, I can't do this thing. 
In him you, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In him also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee. He is the guarantee. You can't mess this up. Of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Hebrews 11, 23 through 27. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and that he was afraid, not afraid of the king's command. By faith, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Listen what it says here. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Whoa, time out a minute. Jesus wasn't even there then. There was, Jesus wasn't until the New Testament. Why does it say that he esteemed, he forsook the th pleasures of Egypt, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt? If Jesus wasn't there, it's because Jesus was there. Jesus was there in the burning bush. Paul tells us here in, in Hebrews, that was Jesus. He was right there in that burning bush. He was right there talking to Moses. He was right there giving uh, Moses his purpose in life, the same as he does to us today. He is giving us purpose today. It is all found in Christ. And it says, for this reason, for he looked to the reward. Remember what it said about, um, about us believing that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those. We have to look toward the reward. The reward is in Christ. When we do that, we will be esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Egypt is type and shadow of this world. Exactly, Richard. We cannot see with our physical eyes. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Let me just give you this real quick about the invisible. We got to pay attention to this word. In the Greek, it's eroratos, meaning unseen or that which cannot be seen. It is made up of two Greek words, a and heratos. Ah means first, but is used in Greek composition as a contraction, giving the hint of privation. Heratos means to gaze at or to be gazed at. The related Hebrew equivalent is mistar, meaning a concealer. The sense drawn from the usage of, the, of this word toward God is not that he cannot be seen, but that he is concealed. God it isn't that God can't be seen. It's that God is concealed. Sin conceals. The law conceals. Grace reveals. What does this tell us about Jesus? What does it say in the scriptures about Christ? How can we see him? Jesus told us very easily, Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's it. Blessed are the pure in heart. How do you get pure in heart? Believe God's grace. Just believe you have favor from God. That's how you become pure of heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. God isn't invisible to those with pure hearts. Those with hearts of grace, God is not invisible. We see him everywhere. And we can grab a hold of who he is. Amen. Listen, I know, I know there's a lot to grab in. I'll post this up on the website maybe tomorrow uh, under messages so that you can go back and kind of review what's there. If you have some questions, you got to grab hold of this and think through it. God has called you with a purpose in your life. The purpose is to glorify him 100% of the time. As soon as you realize that in your life, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in everything that's around you. That's what Romans 1 tells us. Clearly seen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they're going to see God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for leading us to understand a little more about you. Father, we all are called with a purpose. 
The purpose is to glorify you with our whole life, our whole being, Lord God, our whole mind. We thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Be blessed of the Lord and in the power of his might.